This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. They are one of the most notorious street gangs in L.A. They shoot people, they kill people, they rob, they rape, they sell narcotics, they sell weapons. Born out of the will to retaliate against a mighty enemy. Blood had to be a symbol of strength. Someone who's willing to fight, knowing he's outnumbered and may lose the fight. Outmanned two to one by their arch rival, the Crips. The Bloods are an underdog on the streets. It takes more heart to be a Blood than a Crip. To fight the war, they must be unified. And there's no way you should be turning your back on another Blood. And we getting down for the cause. No one stands in the way of their mission. They would kill anyone under the right circumstances. If you're trying to get at the enemy, you know, do what you got to do. To rule the streets of L.A. When you put on red, you're looking for trouble. No neighborhood is safe. They're extremely dangerous and very, very unpredictable. The seriousness of the threat of, from blood gang members in our society on a scale of 1 to 10 is definitely a 10. Pasadena, California, Halloween, 1993. A set of the Bloods were on a mission. Earlier that day, one of their own had been gunned down in a local housing project. A fellow gang member witnessed the shooting. He said the killers were the Bloods' arch rivals, the Crips. In the world of the Bloods, that meant only one thing. You didn't think there was going to be a retaliation. You expected a retaliation. These guys were no nonsense. You know, you get through one of us, we're going to do you. They mounted up, got in their cars, called up all their homies, and uh, went out hunting. On a quiet neighborhood street, a group of 11 teenage boys were trick-or-treating when the Bloods spotted them. Convinced they'd found some Crips, the Bloods parked their cars and sent three armed gang members to set an ambush. Moments later, Debbie Bush also noticed the group of neighborhood boys walking down the street. As Debbie drove the half block to her house, the three gunmen yelled, Now blood! sprang from the bushes and unleashed their rage in a hail of bullets. Before I could get out of the car, I heard the first series of shots, maybe eight to 10 shots. And then there was a second series of shots, maybe another eight to 10. Over 30 shots were fired into the group of unsuspecting trick-or-treaters. I think they were so angry that they were looking and they found what they thought they needed. They just opened fire. I think at the time, though, they were convinced that they were shooting Crips. The incident would become known as the Halloween Massacre. It was surreal. I remember seeing bags of Halloween candy tucked under one of the kid's arm. I'm thinking to myself, oh, what kind of freaking animal does this? The senseless shooting was typical of the violence wrought by the Bloods versus Crips battle that has plagued L.A. streets for decades. With only 9,000 members compared to the Crips' 18,000, the Bloods have always been badly outnumbered. Unity and revenge have been the keys to their survival. Love by few and hated by many. Because that's where we were. We were the outcasts. Because the Crips were more dominant than us. 
The blood's really more inventive, it seemed like. More ruthless and would stick together out of necessity and, and therefore were a little better organized. Being an L.A. blood is, is definitely an underdog. I uh, had to be a true soldier. The battle reaches throughout L.A. One of almost a hundred blood sets can be found on nearly every street corner. The city of L.A. is approximately four million people. It's 26 miles long, and you have blood gang members in almost every sector of this city. Baby Stutterbox was a soldier in the Bloods Army for over a decade. Look, we quit killing Bloods. <laughs> Growing up in Compton in the 1970s, he followed his two older brothers into the gang. Stutterbox's father was overwhelmed by his young son and his gang banging ways. You know, I wasn't doing right at home, and uh, he says, I can't deal with you. you. You know, you're gang active, you, you're doing things that an 11-year-old shouldn't be doing, so I gotta get you out of here. Stutterbox was sent to live with his sister in South Central. At the age of 12, he hooked up with some other boys in the neighborhood and started a new blood set to combat the Crips. We consider ourselves as gangsters. We felt that a gang is a group of people that's doing things together, you know, just silly things together. But a gangster, he's protecting his turf. He's, he's part-time hustler. If you with me, I'm responsible for you, homie. Believe that. No matter what neighborhood they were in, the Bloods were about sticking together. There's no way you should be turning your back on another Blood. We all Bloods. Now what? And we getting down for the cause. We defended each other, you know. We backed each other, you know. We'll stand up and, and die for each other. And, and that's what's unique about the Bloods. You shot me in 80, 86. Fighting the cause left Stutterbox with permanent battle scars. Uh, I shot right here in the back and went to my stomach. November 24th, 1987. Stutterbox was leaving Church's Chicken when he encountered two Crips at the bus stop who noticed he was flamed up. The two men started grilling Stutterbox about where he was from. Uh, man, I'm a grown man. Don't question me. You got a problem, you can deal with it. So he said he ain't got no problem. Stutterbox turned his back and walked away. Seconds later, one of the Crips was behind him. I turned to my right and I seen a gun pointed at my forehead. Shot me right below my temple right here. And uh, the bullet came on my right eye. Stutterbox was just one of the many bloods fighting the war for the streets. Don't read. Look out behind you. Say, hustle down, Earl. For former blood, Mr. Calicoat, gangbanging was about protecting his homies from their rivals. Catch a couple of people slipping, jump out on them, beat them up. We're gonna do some body harm to them. When we was CK riding, and the Crips was doing their thing, it was on and popping. Calico has three bullets lodged in his body. One lies under my tongue, one on my spine, and one on my shoulder. All came out of guns fired by Crips. I've been shot at a lot of times and been hit a lot of times. Not trying to brag, but it goes with the territory. What goes around comes around. In 1985, Calico was in a phone booth when the Crips opened fire on him. The attack left him paralyzed. Then this happened in 85. This is what put me in the chair. 
first bullet hit me in my leg right here. First bullet hit me in my leg right here. It came in this way and came out this way, in and out. As a blood, Calico knew that the attack on him would be avenged by his homies. When I got hit in 85, my homies put it down. They, they, it wasn't no if, ups, and ands about it. You know what I'm saying? When I lost my legs, they wouldn't have like business. I didn't have to do nothing. If a gang is a victim of a violent crime, and if they don't retaliate, you know, it's like anything else. Word gets out on the street, and the next thing you know, all your rivals are coming in here and attacking. You have to, you know, attack back. The Blood's history is steeped in this kind of retaliation. It's a form of street warfare that goes back 35 years. The Bloods have staked their claim to the streets of L.A. From Pasadena to South Central. But the gang would not have existed if not for their arch rivals, the Crips. Formed to battle the Crips' massive street army, the Bloods overcame their lack of numbers by being unified. The gang's roots can be traced back to the turbulent 1960s. In the midst of racial tension between law enforcement and black communities, the activist group, the Black Panthers, were patrolling South Central neighborhoods vigilante style. We knew the legitimacy of what police could and could not do, and we would just watch and take note of what the police were doing. While some residents saw them as a positive force, cleaning up the area and protecting them against racial discrimination by the police, they were often viewed as dangerous militants. In 1969, two leaders of the Panthers were murdered in L.A., creating a vacuum in black youth leadership. With that gap of no one taking care of the neighborhoods, you had individuals now saying, well, you know what, we need to step up, just like the Black Panthers stepped up and protect our neighborhoods. But their concept was very different. Their concept was more juvenile and much more unorganized. Out of this void, the Crips were born. The Crips used aggressive recruitment tactics and swallowed up smaller gangs all across South Central. Membership soared. As they got bigger, they got more muscles and they wanted everybody to become Crips. The gang was invading turf and terrorizing communities throughout L.A. One of those neighborhoods was middle-class Compton. In 1972, Sylvester Puddin Scott, a student at Centennial High School, decided to strike back against the Crips. He pulled together some of his friends and launched a crusade. Their goal was to protect their neighborhood from the Crips and force them off their streets. They got tired of getting jumped and being harassed by these guys called the Crips, and uh, they formed uh, the Piru's on Piru Street in Compton. Two things distinguished the Piru's from the Crips. Their color of choice and their nickname. While the Crips wore blue, the Piru's flew red, the color of Putin's high school. Their nickname was Blood. Bloods was a term that was around in the late 60s for different black people referring to each other as, you know, hey, you're my blood, you know, we're brothers type of thing. So they refer to each other as Blood. Smaller gangs across the greater LA area joined in, standing up and fighting back against the Crips. They united under the banner of the Bloods. Soon, blood sets were popping up all over the city. The blood started as a form of uh, protection for the community, to protect the neighborhoods from the advancements of the Crips. This is a poor example of a two. The guy who did this wrote a two. This is a two-zero for rolling 20s. 
Skip Townsend joined the Rolling Twenties, a blood set from downtown L.A. when he was 13 years old. I wasn't actually put on to Blood Gang. The Crips put me on Bloods when I had to fight them to get home. When I had to fight them in school. When I wanted to go to the movies and they didn't want our communities in the movie theater. That's what put me on Bloods. The challenges I faced by the Crips. Townsend and other Bloods had something the Crips didn't. Unity. While Crips were often battling other Crips, it was understood that blood-on-blood -blood attacks were forbidden. We didn't have no, no confusion amongst different blood sets. We just had, it, it was purity, it was unity, it was defending each other, it was respecting and showing that blood love to each other. This man, known as Kumasi, has lived in the gang-infested neighborhoods of L.A. since the 1950s. Blood socialization is based more, they carry themselves, and they got more honor amongst themselves. Okay, and more dignity, all right, and a sense of unity and a cause and a purpose. Outmanned on average two to one and always a target. Sticking together was the only way the Bloods could survive. It was rough. If you was a Blood and the Crips knew you was a Blood, they was coming at you. To me, it takes more heart to be a Blood than a Crip because we are our numbers. It didn't take anything to be a pivot. Everybody was a pivot. As more gangs united under the umbrella of the Bloods and the gang's numbers grew, the war on the streets quickly escalated to new levels of viciousness. Revenge was violent and swift. South Central, 1984. Blood Keith Tyrone Fudge, a.k.a. Ace Capone, was sitting in his car with two of his homies when a couple of Crips drove up. One of the Crips pulled a gun and stole Capone's car. Capone vowed to get even. Hours later, a party was raging in the center of Crip territory on 54th Street in South Central Los Angeles. Around 9.30 p.m., two cars parked in front of the house. Two men emerged, one sporting a shotgun, the other a rifle. In a hail of bullets, five people were left dead, including two Crips and a 13-year-old girl. Capone was eventually sentenced to death for the murders. The attack, known as the 54th Street Massacre, was part of a new style of gang warfare that sprang up in the 1980s. Toting guns and spree killing became the norm. The Bloods embraced the new style of combat wholeheartedly. The 54th Street Massacre, I don't think, was e either unique or uncommon amongst the uh, blood gangs at the time. We would come up to scenes like that all the time, and uh, you'd, you'd have six, seven, eight victims laying there. The escalating war was due in part to a business opportunity. It's real. Drugs imported from Mexico and South America had hit the streets of L.A. PCP, marijuana, and cocaine flooded in. Bloods bought cocaine and turned it into crack. When he returned to the hood after serving three and a half years for robbery, 19-year-old Calico found the area flooded with crack. Back when I got out in 85, crack cocaine was popping. It was, it was off the hook, off the chain. Crack was cheap, and the profit margin was high. It was also very addictive, which created a guaranteed client base. It was an economic boom for the Bloods. Narcotics made things different, because now there's a lot of money involved. And now that the more money you have, the more access you have to weapons. And that's when we started getting, getting access to 9 millimeters, and back then it was the Uzi's and the Tex. As we saw, the violence enhanced. It got greater. 
you know, more dangerous, more deadlier. Throughout the 80s and early 90s, the battle between the Bloods and Crips escalated. It wasn't about protecting a neighborhood anymore. It was about controlling turf and the drug trade. The streets became killing fields. In the early 80s, all the way through the entire decade, the violence really probably tripled. According to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, between 1985 and 1990, 2,682 people died from gang-related violence in L.A., more than double the previous five years. Many of them were innocent bystanders. We didn't try to hit innocent targets, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of innocent people died behind this gang warfare. I didn't value my life, so I definitely didn't value the life of anyone I came across during that day. The streets were ready to explode. Spring, 1991. Rodney King, a black man, was beaten by white members of the Los Angeles Police Department. The incident, caught on tape, fueled an already tense atmosphere. A year later, when a jury acquitted three of the officers, the streets erupted in violence. Fires were set, stores were looted. Bloods and other gang members incited the violence and controlled the neighborhoods. All gang members, whether they were blood, crips, or Hispanics, saw this as an opportunity for them to take uh, retribution on rival gang members, any other enemies they had, and to come out here and to steal and loot. It was a rush. It was kind of fun just to have, you know, a little unity and just be wild at the time. I can actually remember running into a, a rival gang member and we looked at each other and said, hey, man, let's get this money because either we're going to kill each other right here and don't get nothing or we can get something to keep it moving. I'll catch you another day. So that's how it was. The riots lasted for six days. When it was over, 54 people were dead. In what seemed like progress amidst the charred and smoldering city, several sets from the Crips and the Bloods got together and agreed that there had been enough bloodshed. We yeah. try to bring peace and harmony, man. That's right. All these people out here is different generations, man. They decided to put down their weapons and call a truce. It was a nice and a beautiful thing to see, but I'm going to keep it real. I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. The truce evaporated within three months. It's kind of hard to look the other way when you know that this guy killed your brother or whatever. By 1995, gang violence was again raging and reached an all-time high. According to the L.A. Sheriff's Department, 807 people were murdered that year, and the Bloods were at the heart of the bloodshed. No one was immune. By the mid-1990s, the Bloods were engaged in an all-out drug turf war against their rival, Original fun on crap. the Crips. In the midst of record-breaking murder rates, the Bloods found another way to make money. Gangsta rap. Straight from the streets of Compton, Blood rappers DJ Quick, The Game, and Death Row Records founder Suge Knight were cashing in. They were involved in gangs, they got money from narcotics sales, and they turned that into their record business. It's been highly profitable for a lot of the gang members. Knight brought gangster culture to the mainstream. One of his biggest success stories was rapper Tupac Shakur. While Shakur was not a blood, he hung with the gang. Las Vegas, September 7, 1996. Knight, Shakur, and a posse of Bloods attended a heavyweight fight at the MGM. 
the whole death row entourage was coming through the hallway and uh, they came across a guy from the Southside Crips from Compton. And then Tupac, trying to show his allegiance to the Bloods, goes up and, and beat him down. About two hours after the attack, Knight and Shakur were headed to a nightclub when a white Cadillac pulled up next to them and unloaded a slew of bullets into their BMW. Knight was grazed in the head. Six days later, Shakur died. Back in LA, revenge for the attack was swift. The violence went back to Compton right after that because of uh, Crip sets and blood sets involved. In the next 10 days, I think we had three murders here and about uh, 15 to 20 shootings, incidents behind what happened in Las Vegas. Despite an intense investigation, Tupac's murder remains unsolved. The rampage in Compton was classic blood retaliation. Nothing new to the streets of South Central. Man, <clears throat> L.A. L.A. it is what it is. Hey, we've been on the motherfucking news, blood. This is where it was. Gang banging originated from. Yeah, text with 30 round clips for you. The main reason why L.A. is different is because it's the origin. So we have the history, the culture, the language. We're not trying to imitate or emulate anyone else. The neighborhoods where the blood started are the home and heart of the gang. The graffiti that adorns the buildings holds a key to their world. The walls are like newspaper, you know, of uh, the neighborhoods, you know, and it'll tell you whose neighborhood it is. It's going to cross out the rivals and tell you who that they're after, who the bad guys are. Every blood set from Compton goes by the name of Pyru as an homage to where all the bloods were started. Let's go take a look and see which bloods are hanging out. And this is where they hang out, they sell drugs. What's up? Bullet hole in this car, you got bullet holes in the wall. Been a lot of shootings on this block uh, by the rivals coming and shooting into the dead end. They choose this spot because it's a, it's kind of a fortress, one way in, one way out and they, uh, it's hard for their enemies to get to them. The different blood sets are all unified by their color, red. Red is bright, so that's like a power that means you're strong. And then when you wear, uh, wear red as a blood, you're just ready for it. So it's like flame on, bring it to me. We're gonna do what we need to do. They also share a common language. Crips, you call them crabs, you rig it. Uh, sea monsters, and then when you say blood, it's like Damu. There's a blood street code. Hand signs, unique to each set, are thrown as greetings to each other and to taunt rivals. But being a blood goes much deeper than just hand signs and colors. Being a blood for me is a feeling. It's not something I can explain. Bloods to me, stand on your own two feet and have your business. Seven, seven, seven. While being a blood is a rush, it also brings on trouble. Still, they choose to belong. These young men from Inglewood have been stopped and shaken down by the police. This is a gang hangout for Inglewood Family Bloods. They hang out here, they intimidate the customers here, they rob people. You have rival gang right up the street right here, so they drive up and down the street and shoot at these people. Talking to them after they've been jammed up, they are eager to share their thoughts on blood life. I think what's special about the blood is just we just active. I just grew up around them. They was always doing shit that just acting. We keep it violent over here, so we, we ain't scared of the violence. It's the young bloods in the neighborhood whom police and area residents fear the most. The ones that are that age between 14 and 20, they're the ones that are new to the gang. They're the ones that are trying to make a name for themselves and prove to other gang members that they're tough and that they have heart. So they're the ones I expect to have the guns. They're the ones I expect to be violent. Police say that they're seeing more younger bloods on the streets and that gang membership is on the rise. 
Everybody wants to be popular. Everybody wants that power. Kings give you a sense of power. It's not like they have big recruitment drives where come one, come all, here's your free bottle of soda for joining the Bloods. The majority of kids involved in these gangs are just looking for something to connect to. Many of the older Bloods say that these teenagers don't understand what they're signing up for. I feel they join because they don't have no alternative. They don't have no outlook. They ain't knowing the hood gonna get you caught up. A lot of these youths out here, you know, they 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 want a game bang. They 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 don't know what it means to game bang. For many of these young bangers, that understanding comes too late. When they get shot up, they be paralyzed, or they they be incarcerated. They wish they would never game bang. Stutterbox came to that realization the day he tried to run from a crip who just fired a bullet through his right eye. An attack that left him permanently blind. When the guy shot again, when he shot again, he shot me in my back right here and the bullet went to my stomach. It caused me to have a colostomy bag. Another shot broke his arm in half. As I was down, he uh, click, click, click. But he had him more bullets, and then he, he ran away. Stutterbox lay blind and bleeding in the street. A female, you know, lady, crackhead, whatever they call Like Like, she came over there, she picked me up, picked my head up off the ground, and got to wiping the blood from my face, and uh, told me it was going to be all right. In that moment, Stutterbox turned away from his life as a blood. But I got 50 seconds, at the bottom you got blood inside the O's, so you got P and the B. When his homie tried to retaliate against the shooter, Stutterbox stopped him. I didn't want that. I, I just told him to leave that alone because, uh, you know, you reap what you sow, so I'm just suffering what I, I reaped out in my days, so I have to respect that. And uh, I'm just fortunate to be here living. By not seeking revenge, Stutterbox broke with blood tradition. Retaliation was part of the code. The Bloods are very volatile. They could kill somebody, rob somebody, um, beat somebody down, uh, and it just comes as part of the culture, the gang culture. Pasadena, California, 1993, Halloween. In retaliation for the murder of one of their own, a group of bloods went on a killing spree and attacked a group of innocent teenage boys on their way home Halloween night. Debbie Bush, an employee of the Pasadena PD Forensics Unit, heard the gunshots from her home six doors down from the scene. I knew they were coming from the direction where I last saw the boys and I took off running. I don't know what I was, I, I think at that time I was running more as somebody trained in crime scene because I don't think that I had any idea what I was going to actually encounter. What she found were three dead boys. I noticed that there was a, a person, a, a body that was down there and I checked the pulse and I realized that, that person wasn't alive. And the second body that was on the parkway, I noticed it had a bullet hole in the back of the head type thing. The second boy was Debbie's 14-year-old son, Stephen. Stephen's body was about right about here. I knew from the clothing that it was him. This is very painful, a lot more painful than I thought. Where I was standing there, there's took a tree candy in the sidewalk and blood stain pillowcases, all that kind of stuff, you know. So it's 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 not easy, um, you know. And you figure 15 years, it should be almost 15 years, it should be easy. It's not. It's not. The incident, known as the Halloween Massacre, drove home how far the war between the Bloods and the Crips had spun out of control. This whole situation was so surreal to me. You don't think of Halloween candy and blood being two of the same, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Seven weeks after the attack, police charged three liters of the bloods with first degree murder. Two years later, Lorenzo Newborn, Herbert McLean, and Carl Holmes went to trial. 
The defendants treated the proceedings like a joke. I cut the dramatic Every day, Debbie Bush went to court and faced the men accused of killing her son. It's very numbing, it's very personal, it's very hurtful. They were very disrespectful to me. They showed pictures of the boys, laughs and jeers. They just were just horrible. Their allegiance was to their gang and they let it be known. Their death penalty shall be inflicted upon you, Mr. McLean. All three were sentenced to death. Debbie Bush still struggles with the loss of her son. There's a part of my family that's missing, and then there's somebody that's gonna be burying a loved one in, in the next week due to senseless violence because somebody owes their allegiance to a gang. Pasadena is still plagued by bloods. They may be outnumbered elsewhere, but here they are the dominant gang. 95% of the black street gangs in the city are bloods. Police Sergeant Voskin Gordikian and Officer Sean Dawkins are part of Pasadena's gang unit. We see everything as far as the, the crime activity for our blood gangs. Their crimes range from murder, robberies, carjackings, simple assaults, all types of drug activities. Some of them don't wear anything to display that they're blood, but uh, more so what we're seeing in Pasadena is their belts. They wear the, the nylon type belts that hang real low, some, some of them all the way down to their knees. So the term is flying their colors or they're all flamed up because of the red in the belt. Um, and you'll see it also in their shoes, their laces on their shoes, they still use the laces. But bandanas, you don't see that too much hanging out of their pockets anymore. That's only one traffic. Did you, whose car is it? That's my car. Sergeant Gordikian and Officer Dawkins saw this young man and his friends jump out of their car and quickly duck into a store when they spotted police. After a search of the vehicle and a brief interrogation, was it robbery? The officers determined the young man had an outstanding warrant. How about the car is a car street? Tonight, he was going to jail. The gang unit makes routine stops like this every night. What caught my attention was the one gentleman had uh, the red baseball cap on and he had his red sleeves exposed with the black jersey. And that looked kind of odd. It looked like gang attire to me. He eventually admitted to being on probation for robbery. He's got knowledge. The police try to keep their finger on the pulse of the streets. Every day is a challenge. I mean, it's us trying to stay on top of them, what the gang's doing, how it's evolving what new trends they're moving into, what new areas they're moving into. One new trend holds the key to the future of the Bloods. After years of battle, the Crips may no longer be their worst enemy. It may be the Bloods themselves. Compton. In a dispute over stolen drugs, a blood shot a fellow blood from a different set. The murder was the latest twist in the violent world of the Bloods. 18th Street, this West Side. Blood on blood attacks, once forbidden, are on the rise. It really is a confusing thing when, in this day and age, you have blood on blood fighters. A new generation of bangers has led to a breakdown of one of the gang's founding principles. The game has flipped now. We never fought each other. The game has changed. They're more unorganized. The unity is tore up. Nobody really goes by, by the old rules anymore. With many of the original leaders in prison or dead, the gang has been left without structure. They're left without direction. They're left without mentors who they can respect. You understand what I'm saying? And so 
it gets wilder and wilder and wilder. And then we become savages and our neighborhoods become a wilderness and that's where we're going today. With the infrastructure of the bloods crumbling, the streets have become a free-for-all. But now it's just every man for himself. So they don't, they, they don't look up to nobody. There's no, like, no OGs out here or anything. There's no unity and nobody looks up to nobody. Now these guys just want to grab a gun and shoot it out. It's a whole twist in this blood thing. You got the youngsters, they, they feel they don't want nobody nothing. They don't care. A lot of these younger guys, just uh, they're moving by emotions. They're moving by how they feel right now. And there isn't a level of respect at all. And if they feel upset or disrespected right now, they're willing to shoot or fight. And it doesn't matter, crip or blood, that doesn't matter. After 20 years of upholding blood love, Skip Townsend had a change of heart. In 1998, he was facing a life sentence for the attempted murder of a crip. Ironically, that crip saved him from a life behind bars. The guy who was shot stood up and said, I know Skip, he didn't shoot me. I was shot by somebody else. He knew who shot him, and I still got a hung jury. People still said I did it. And the guy who was shot said I didn't. Prosecutors decided to drop the case. Once back in the neighborhood, Skip vowed to make a difference. He now works to keep kids off the street. The poison and the antidote are one and the same. If I was bitten by a snake right now and I had to go to the hospital, well, what they would do is give me the antidote with some of the poison in it. So it's important that I help as well. Change the redirection. It's an uphill battle. Oh, God, it's not going to be set for the nap, snake. Be aware. Let's forget it out here. There's no other set like this. We'll be having it popping. Just be over here, you feel me, all day. We'll be getting alive, making money. I think all gangs are more dangerous than they used to be because of that lack of respect for the hierarchy of the gang leadership, if you will. I think they're very, very unpredictable. And I think that's evident by how ferocious some of these attacks are. Look at that from my point of view. You're wearing red from head to toe. Your homie wearing red from head to toe. I see more shooting at police officers. I see more senseless murders. It seems like uh, the, the new generation is aimless and much more violent. The streets have turned even more deadly. Where are you from? Step on back here for a second. They kill citizens, innocent people. They kill the police. They kill each other. That's what they do. They shoot people. As the unpredictable violence increases, many of the older bloods are steering away from the life. Stutterbox now works with a nonprofit organization that focuses on gang prevention and intervention with local kids. The turning point for Calico came the year he lost six of his homies. That's what really made me wake up too and realize that don't nobody win the war. We won, don't get me wrong, we won the war for a long time. But then when it started hitting you in your face, especially close loved ones, it's senseless. Look at look at these days, Calico spends most of his time coaching young kids from the neighborhood. It's his way of guiding the youth away from gang life. Only way I can fix it is just doing what I'm doing with these babies. Hey, y'all got to hustle, y'all tired? I can't save everybody. I can't correct no grown folks. Come on, man, girl, slow it down. You tired? I guess I can say I'm still here for a reason. I should have been gone a long time ago. Time will tell if the younger bloods will listen to their elders. Or if the breakdown in respect and unity will be their undoing. Until then, the danger is real. I think the, the seriousness of the threat of, from blood gang members in our society on a scale of 1 to 10 is definitely a 10. See the black man. back each other, you know, we'll stand up and, and die for each other 
And, and that's what's unique about the Bloods. You shot me in 80, 86. Fighting the cause left Stutterbox with permanent battle scars. Uh, I shot right here in the back and went to my stomach. November 24th, 1987. Stutterbox was leaving Church's Chicken when he encountered two crips at the bus stop who noticed he was flamed up. The two men started grilling Stutterbox about where he was from. Uh, man, I'm a grown man. Don't question me. You got a problem, you can deal with it. So he said he ain't got no problem. Stutterbox turned his back and walked away. Seconds later, one of the Crips was behind him. I turned to my right, and I seen a gun pointed at my forehead. Shot me right below my temple right here, and uh, the bullet came on my right eye. Stutterbox was just one of the many bloods fighting the war for the streets. Don't read! Look out behind you! Say, I saw that, Earl! For former blood, Mr. Calicoat, gangbanging was about protecting his homies from their rivals. Can be found on nearly every street corner. The city of LA is approximately 4 million people. It's 26 miles long, and you have blood gang members in almost every sector of this city. Baby Stutterbox was a soldier in the Bloods Army for over a decade. Look, we quit killing Bloods. <laughs> Growing up in Compton in the 1970s, he followed his two older brothers into the gang. Stutterbox's father was overwhelmed by his young son and his gang banging ways. You know, I wasn't doing right at home, and uh, he said, I can't deal with you. you. You know, you're gang active, you, you're doing things that a 11 year old shouldn't be doing, so I gotta get you out of here. Stutterbox was sent to live with his sister in South Central. At the age of 12, he hooked up with some other boys in the neighborhood and started a new blood set to combat the Crips. We consider ourselves as gangsters. We feel that a gang is a group of people that's doing things together, you know, just silly things together. But a gangster, he's protecting his turf. He's, he's part-time hustler. If you with me, I'm responsible for you, homie. Believe that. No matter what neighborhood they were in, the Bloods were about sticking together. There's no way you should be turning your back on another Blood. We all Bloods. Now what? And we getting down for the cause. We defended each other, you know, we... This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. They are one of the most notorious street gangs in L.A. They shoot people, they kill people, they rob, they rape, they sell narcotics, they sell weapons. Born out of the will to retaliate against a mighty enemy. Blood had to be a symbol of strength. Someone who's willing to fight, knowing he's outnumbered and may lose the fight. Outmanned two to one by their arch rival, the Crips. The Bloods are an underdog on the streets. It takes more heart to be a Blood than a Crip. To fight the war, they must be unified. And there's no way you should be turning your back on another Blood. And we getting down for the cause. No one stands in the way of their mission. They would kill anyone under the right circumstances. If you're trying to get at the enemy, you know, do what you got to do. To rule the streets of L.A. When you put on red, you're looking for trouble. No neighborhood is safe.
They're extremely dangerous and very, very unpredictable. The seriousness of the threat of, from blood gang members in our society on a scale of 1 to 10 is definitely a 10. Car, I heard the first series of shots, maybe eight to ten shots. And then there was a second series of shots, maybe another eight to ten. Over 30 shots were fired into the group of unsuspecting trick-or-treaters. I think they were so angry that they were looking and they found what they thought they needed. They just opened fire. I think at the time, though, they were convinced that they were shooting Crips. The incident would become known as the Halloween Massacre. It was surreal. I remember seeing bags of Halloween candy tucked under one of the kid's arm. I'm thinking to myself, oh, what kind of freaking animal does this? The senseless shooting was typical of the violence wrought by the Bloods versus Crips battle that has plagued LA streets for decades. With only 9,000 members compared to the Crips' 18,000, the Bloods have always been badly outnumbered. Unity and revenge have been the keys to their survival. Loved by few and hated by many, because that's what we were. We were the outcasts, because the Crips were more dominant than us. The Bloods really more inventive, it seemed like, more ruthless and would stick together out of necessity and, and therefore were a little better organized. Being an L.A. blood is, is definitely an underdog. I uh, had to be a true soldier. The battle reaches throughout L.A. One of almost a hundred blood sets. Pasadena, California, Halloween, 1993. A set of the Bloods were on a mission. Earlier that day, one of their own had been gunned down in a local housing project. A fellow gang member witnessed the shooting. He said the killers were the Bloods' arch rivals, the Crips. In the world of the Bloods, that meant only one thing. You didn't think there was going to be a retaliation. You expected a retaliation. These guys were no nonsense. You know, you get through one of us, we're going to do you. They mounted up, got in their cars, called up all their homies, and uh, went out hunting. On a quiet neighborhood street, a group of 11 teenage boys were trick-or-treating when the Bloods spotted them. Convinced they'd found some Crips, the Bloods parked their cars and sent three armed gang members to set an ambush. Moments later, Debbie Bush also noticed the group of neighborhood boys walking down the street. As Debbie drove the half block to her house, the three gunmen yelled, Now, Blood! sprang from the bushes and unleashed their rage in a hail of bullets. Before I could get out of 